Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. A woman in her 40s entered the house. She was dressed in a summer white dress and white beads adorned her neck. Why have you dressed up? Patricia asked, placing a kettle on the stove. She was surprised by the unexpected arrival of an uninvited guest and her stained apron clearly indicated it. You won't believe it. Liberato invited me to go to the city for the first time in years, Miriam Gill replied with admiring eyes. And you've dressed up like it's a wedding, just look at you. Patricia Martinez couldn't stop commenting on her appearance. Miriam was angry at her friend, who made these sharp remarks. She threw her summer scarf on the bench nearby, walked into the kitchen, and sat on a chair, clearly expressing her displeasure. My wedding has long passed, but your daughter will have to deal with it soon, Miriam tried to provoke Patricia emotionally. Patricia looked at her with anger in her sparkling eyes, but a hint of worry and even desperation could be seen in them. She sat across from her friend and sighed heavily. Her groom is something. I don't know what to do, the poor woman in the apron confessed. What's the matter? Miriam inquired. Patricia took another deep breath and began. I don't like him. I always told my daughter to choose one of our nationalities. And in the end, she chose some Chinese guy. No offense to the Chinese people, I love them all dearly, but who will continue our family line, huh? She loves him, what can I do? You should have told your daughter clearly. We honor traditions. I told her, exclaimed Patricia, almost in despair. She replied that he was born here. But the woman didn't have time to finish. Rufina descended from the second floor. She was very confused by the presence of a stranger in their house. However, she recognized that Miriam was their guest. As long as she could remember, they often spent time together. Sometimes their mothers would leave them alone, or they would go together to swim in the lake or celebrate some holiday together. She was almost like a part of their family, but lately, they had been seeing each other less frequently. Rufina increasingly immersed herself in work. It's worth noting that, although the girl lived in the village, her work was not related to agriculture at all. She had mastered the most modern profession of a programmer. With the money left by her father as an inheritance, she bought a good computer and spent entire days immersed in this gadget. In general, the last time Rufina saw Miriam was two years ago, although, as her mother said, Miriam visited them almost every day. Of course, they met from time to time, but they hadn't had heart-to-heart -heart talks for a long time. Sometimes, it hurt that while she was working in her little room on the second floor, her mother and her friend always enjoyed themselves, watching movies, cooking, or discussing something. Miriam! Rufina exclaimed with delight, rushing into the woman's embrace. She warmly smiled at her, saying, Oh, dear Rufina, it's been so long since I saw you. Your mother told me you're getting married. Why didn't you share it with your old friend? She asked. Oh, I forgot. Rufina blushed. The wedding will be held next week. We'll definitely invite you. Without waiting for an answer, she went outside in a cheerful mood while Miriam began to extract information from Patricia. Next week? And I just found out about it now? Well, I found out three days ago. Before that, she didn't tell me anything. Patricia complained. Oh, what a disaster. What kind of parents does this groom have? Are they well-mannered? I don't know anything, Miriam. I haven't even met them. They're supposed to come over in a few days to introduce themselves. Oh, what a nightmare, Miriam sighed, lowering her head in thought. And do you at least know his name? Patricia just shook her head, feeling ashamed of herself. But her daughter wouldn't reveal anything. She said it would be a surprise. Patricia hated such surprises. When will you find out everything? Her friend continued asking her. Well, I think when they arrive. I've been on edge for three days. I took sedatives, but nothing helped. I just don't want to have Chinese relatives. I don't want to. But on the other hand, who am I to go against my daughter's will? Clearly, she loves him. 
She has talked only about him and the wedding in the last few days. And she has such dreamy eyes. Even now, did you see how she walked out? She's definitely over the moon. Yes, my friend, Miriam said thoughtfully. It's not an easy situation. But I think there's still a way out of it. When do you say these newly found relatives are coming? The day after tomorrow, Patricia replied. Her friend's mysterious tone intrigued her. Miriam seemed to be thinking of something ingenious. She could always come up with excellent ideas. Tell them to sleep in the barn next to the cows, as there's no spare room in the house. Miriam suggested. Patricia was stunned by such a proposal. On one hand, it seemed utterly absurd and ridiculous. On the other hand, it was something phenomenal. But I have plenty of space in the house, don't I? Patricia couldn't understand. Thank God, my late husband was wealthy. We live well, and we have many spare rooms. Don't you get it? The interlocutor exclaimed. Lie and say there isn't any. That all the rooms are occupied, you had no time to sort things out. They'll run away immediately with such a trick, and they'll take their son with them. Mark my words. Well, I don't know, Rufina's mother hesitated. Maybe it's not worth it. Rufina will be upset. She won't understand anything. When you have a feast, just gradually pour them drinks so they don't go to sleep right away. The young ones will get drunk quickly and head out to have fun. We won't stay with them. After that, you can freely offer them the barn for the night, the guest chuckled. Rufina won't get it, and by the morning, the groom will be gone. Patricia sighed a couple of times, wanting to say something but stumbling. I don't know, Patricia continued to waver in doubt. It just doesn't feel right. After all, it's my daughter, and I'm depriving her of true love. I don't understand you. Is saving your family more important to you, or do you want to have new relatives? These Chinese people, mark my words, are cunning. You may die, and this son-in-law will take everything, leaving your Rufina with nothing. Patricia's inheritance was substantial by village standards, and she genuinely considered herself a prosperous woman. Her daughter, by city standards, was not going to suffer from poverty either. Most of it came from her husband, and she had saved some through her own efforts. Of course, she wasn't planning to die anytime soon, but she started worrying about her daughter's fate. Patricia didn't respond to Miriam, she just escorted her outside, pretending to be busy with many tasks. Alone with her thoughts, Patricia began to contemplate. Her friend's plan seemed truly ingenious to her. It would undoubtedly succeed, but what if this deception were revealed? Rufina would never forgive her. She couldn't let her find out. That's why Patricia decided to add her own twist to this excellent plan. Rufina returned home two days later, arm in arm, with her fiancé. She deliberately went to meet him at the station. Patricia, in turn, was waiting for them on the porch. Evaluating the appearance of the future son-in-law, she realized that she had been slightly mistaken. He was quite handsome, with little resemblance to a Chinese. But still, it was evident that his roots were definitely not Spanish. This fact deeply disappointed the future mother-in-law. Good day, Patricia, the young man said, showing his pearly smile. I'm delighted to see you. My name is Vidal. Rufina has told me a lot about you. He introduced himself politely and extended his hand. Patricia shook his hand warmly in response. She invited them into the house, with Rufina entering first, followed by her future husband. The girl decided to give him a small tour of the house, while Patricia was waiting for the parents of this young man. However, fifteen minutes passed, then thirty, and no one came. Perplexed, she entered the house and approached Rufina to find out the circumstances of such behavior by the future relatives. Darling, where are our guests, actually? Rufina pulled away from Vidal and turned to her mother. Her face took on a slightly serious expression. They will arrive in the evening. You don't have to wait for them now, Mom, Rufina smiled. Patricia was a bit disconcerted. She thought it was an inappropriate tone, but she kept silent. She didn't want to discuss these people in front of her son. 
She had already set the table and was now sitting in the dining room, reading the newspaper, awaiting the dear guests. Suddenly, Rufina entered the room. She kept glancing around as if she were afraid of being watched. The daughter gently closed the door to the dining room and almost tiptoed to her mother. Patricia was intrigued by this behavior. Rufina rarely acted so strangely. Rufina, what happened? Patricia asked. Rufina looked around, but no one was behind her. This fact seemed to calm her, and she sat on a chair next to her mother, asking, So, what do you think of him? Without hiding her excitement, Patricia was taken aback. She did not expect that her opinion would be so valuable and important to her daughter. Well, I, Patricia began. Mom, faster. The doll won't spend half an hour looking at the painting on the second floor. Well, he's good. Is that all? Is that all you can say? Patricia was embarrassed by her daughter's insistence, but she had no desire to say everything that was on her mind, as she did to Miriam the day before. Rufina would never forgive her for that. She asked for an independent opinion, so she would get it. He's quite well-mannered and polite. I like your choice, my dear, Patricia said. It cannot be said that there was no truth in this, as Vidal did indeed make that impression. However, the old convictions did not disappear. Patricia, despite her reluctance to give her daughter away to him, still held the same opinion. Cool. Thanks, Mom. Love you exclaimed Rufina joyfully, kissing her mother on the cheek. Then she quickly ran away. And within a few seconds, the spacious dining room was empty again. Observing the clock on the beige wall, Patricia delved into her thoughts. Back then, she and her husband were just settling into this house. Construction debris was piled up everywhere. The rooms were filled with unpacked boxes, but Patricia anticipated the happiness she would feel when the renovation was finally finished. Mario had recently been promoted at work, and they received a substantial bonus. The couple had finally decided to take this serious step, buying their own house. Patricia was tired of living in his parents' house. Moreover, this wooden house was certainly not the culmination of her dreams. And now they could afford this brick, two-story house with a stove and even a built-in toilet. Well, it was certainly their dream house. Wow, Patricia. Miriam also admired entering her friend's new home for the first time. What a splendid house you've built. It's so bright and clean. It's for our future little daughter. Patricia smiled, caressing her growing belly. And how did you know it would be a girl? Her friend laughed. At that time, ultrasounds weren't yet widely used. I just know, that's all. We're choosing between Valeriana and Rufina, Patricia responded with a sly smile. Mario really wants Rufina, he insists a lot. But we'll see as time goes on. Suddenly, Mario entered the house, carrying a large box in his hands. The women looked at him with surprise. He went into the living room and took out an item from the box. There were clocks, large wooden clocks. He hung them on the nail in the wall. Now we'll always know what time it is, he proudly announced. Patricia smiled and gently kissed her husband. I don't care how much time passes as long as you're with me. I'm ready to live with you forever, she said. So, a month passed, the term was already six months, and her belly was clearly visible to everyone. Everyone was already asking what they would name their child. But it was fate that made the choice. Outside, it was a very gloomy, rainy evening. Patricia was sitting by the stove, cross-stitching a picture that would soon depict their garden. Suddenly, someone knocked on the front door. After it, lightning flashed and thunder rumbled. It was frightening and nerve-wracking. Patricia reluctantly got up from her chair and went to the door. She did not expect to see a police officer. Good day. Are you Patricia Martinez? He asked. Yes, it's me, the frightened woman replied. May I come in? I need to tell you something, but I don't think I can do it outside. Quick-witted by nature, Patricia was always ready for trouble, so she stopped the man bursting into the house and asked. 
First, please show your license. The man started looking for it in his pocket with a very dissatisfied expression. Finally, he pulled out a small card. Well, all right. Please come in, Patricia said. No, she wasn't afraid of the police. She loved and respected this profession very much. Partly because her husband was also a police officer, he taught her various tricks and informed her about safety and the existence of scammers, explaining how to protect herself in the most challenging situations. So, she had a general idea of how to stay safe. When she led the police officer into the living room, she examined him once again. Indeed, he was a law enforcement officer. Her intuition never let her down. Coffee? She politely offered. No, thank you. It's better if you sit down, the man said in a calmer tone. Patricia looked at him with surprise, but followed his request, sitting opposite him in an armchair. I have the difficult task of informing you of some news, he began seriously. Patricia frowned and leaned in closer. Your husband died on duty, the man finally said. It was evident that it was not easy for him. Even his face changed, reddening. Patricia did not react to these words for a long time. Her face remained unchanged, but the reaction was evident through the tears streaming down her cheeks. When she noticed it, she leaned back in the chair, still showing no emotions. Patricia, the police officer, said sympathetically, gently touching her trembling hand. Your husband will forever be a hero. You must remember only the good things about him. Our child, the woman said in a quiet and hoarse voice. In her eyes, the spark that had always shone with hope for a long and happy life with her beloved husband was fading. The police officer did not say anything. He just sighed quietly and lowered his head, still holding Patricia's hand. Her current state depended entirely on someone's friendly support, and he understood it well. After a few minutes of silence, Patricia finally asked, How did he die? The police officer looked at her with a guilty look and said, He was shot by a shoplifter. We were on our way. But the woman raised her hand, as if indicating that she didn't want to hear anything more. I think, for now, I shouldn't know the details, Patricia explained in a subdued voice. The man didn't say anything more. They had been sitting like that for another half hour. Soon, Patricia began to recover a bit from the shock she had just experienced. Tell me, how did it happen? She asked sternly. I won't be able to live without knowing. We were recent partners, the police officer began. You do know Valerio Cano, right? Of course, she nodded. He's a friend and partner of Mario. So, this time, he fell ill, and I was teamed up with Mario. As usual, we went on a mission. Mario was thinking of going home to you. Our shift officially ended half an hour ago. But our chief insisted we go to the scene. There was no choice. We arrived at a small toy store, and the glass was shattered there. We didn't want any commotion. No one threatened the criminal with weapons. Mario volunteered to just talk, but suddenly the thief shot him. I didn't expect it. No one did. I rushed to help, radioed for backup, and called an ambulance. But Mario asked me first to catch the criminal. When I was about to run and find him, I saw the guy sitting on his knees. He was crying and saying he didn't want this. Unfortunately, whether he wanted it or not, the bullet hit the most vital organ, his heart. The doctors couldn't do anything. But while we were waiting for medical help, Mario managed to write this note to you. Well, I was writing while he was saying it. The police officer handed her the piece of paper. It was stained with blood, and Patricia's heart sank. It was her husband's blood, her most beloved person, who was no longer alive. With trembling hands, she unfolded the paper. Patricia, my dearest, I'm dying. I feel like we won't see each other again. Please take care of our little daughter. I believe you can handle it. I love you. Don't forget me, and don't blame yourself. I fulfilled my duty live for our daughter after reading this farewell letter written in someone else's handwriting tears streamed down patricia's face she had never felt such pain 
She felt abandoned and broken. She was left alone. His last word was, your name, the chief said through gritted teeth. It seemed like he could barely hold back tears and emotions. He was your husband and my friend, and we will never forget him. Patricia smiled through her tears. These words did manage to comfort her a little. Two days later, the funeral took place. Poor Patricia had been standing for a long time by her husband's fresh grave, crying incessantly. How will I live without you, Mario? She cried. I won't be able to, and I won't cope with it. We wanted so much to raise our daughter together. The same police officer was watching it. He was hiding behind the trees and also cried from time to time. He understood that he was also guilty of it. It was so unbearable to watch his wife suffering that he eventually left. Patricia, however, had been sitting near her late husband's grave for a long time. Well, at least the trial turned out to be fair. The thief turned out to be a young man, almost the same age as Patricia. What the hell was he doing in a toy store? Nobody, including himself, could explain. There was no huge profit in the cash register. They didn't even have a safe. What was the innocent police officer killed for? What did this simpleton receive a 10-year sentence for? It was a senseless death and a senseless verdict that this young criminal handed to himself. Patricia didn't want to be present in the courtroom. She didn't want to see the face of her husband's killer. She wouldn't be able to handle it. She didn't want to look into the eyes that witnessed Mario's death. Moreover, in her state, she couldn't let herself worry. She tried to do it as little as possible. But sometimes she had breakdowns. She would throw things, break dishes, and curse her miserable life. Neighbor Miriam helped her. She supported her throughout this period, from the beginning of the funeral to the trial and beyond. The friend genuinely helped Patricia not to get discouraged. Patricia already had the ninth month of pregnancy. It was late December. The month was coming to an end, and everyone was getting ready for the new year. The wound of loss was slowly healing, leaving behind a deep, aching scar. Patricia visited her husband's grave every week, leaving him either candy or spruce branches. Unfortunately, she couldn't leave his favorite lilies, which always grew in their garden in the summer. In that field, in childhood, they became friends. Young Mario once gave her a large bouquet of lilies, which he picked from his grandmother's garden. He got in trouble for it later. Patricia cherished this warm memory in her heart. It warmed her even in the coldest frosts. And on that Sunday, December 25th, Miriam came to visit the grave again. Soon, our Rufina will be born. You wanted to name her like that, right? She asked, hoping for an answer. Well, of course, there was no answer. Instead, there was complete, undisturbed cemetery silence. Nothing here disturbed Mario's peace. Snow covered his grave like a white blanket. Patricia smiled, knowing that he was now in a better place. You know, Miriam sewed such beautiful dresses for our daughter. She will grow up to be the most beautiful girl in the village. And then she'll meet some boy in that field, and he'll give her beautiful lilies. Like you gave me. You remember, right? Patricia continued with tears in her eyes. I miss you, Mario. I hope you're doing well. I'm sure you'll always watch over us from the other side. I promise I won't let you down. Rufina will grow up smart and beautiful, and she'll be as brave as her father. Right, Mario? And Patricia began crying again from hopelessness. She still felt very, very bad. The wound from the untimely loss was healing agonizingly slowly, and every memory echoed with the painful throbbing in her heart. But she had to remain strong for their daughter. On that day, she had a beautiful dream in which Mario was alive. They were sitting together in that meadow. Patricia was sitting on the grass, enveloped in these white flowers, inhaling their scent and looking at the bright summer sun. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Mario appeared. He was dressed so beautifully, he was wearing a shirt that Patricia had once given him for his birthday. This bright white shirt with blue flowers harmoniously blended into the beautiful landscape. Mario? Patricia exclaimed, standing up. 
Patricia. The man smiled. I miss you so much, Patricia admitted, hugging him and crying. I miss you too, my love. How will Rufina live without you and without her father? Without your strong shoulder, without your courage and nobility? I'm afraid, Mario. I'm afraid I won't be able to raise her into a worthy person. Don't be afraid, my dear. And remember that I live in your heart and in our daughter's heart too. I'm always with you. Life may have separated us, but I'm here. I'm still here. Patricia wanted to lose herself in this dream forever, but her dreams were suddenly interrupted by Rafina's voice. The woman woke up and realized that an hour had passed. These hours seemed enchanted, it was like she had plunged into the past. But now it was time to go back to the present. Mom, are you here? Rufina asked mockingly, waving her hand in front of her mother's face. Patricia fully woke up. Her daughter was standing in front of her, and behind her was her fiancé, who seemed concerned about the future mother-in-law. Are you okay? The doll asked with a concerned tone. Yes, sorry, Patricia politely replied. Are the guests already on their way? Yes, they will be here in an hour. The doll and I will go meet them. We wanted to tell you this, Rufina said. Oh, yes, of course, go ahead. I'll prepare everything here. Rufina cast another strange look at her mother and still left, taking Vidal with her. Everything was fine with this guy. Only one thing was missing. He didn't have any Spanish roots. Well, he didn't look like a Spaniard at all. As soon as they have children, people will immediately call them little Chinese. It hadn't been 15 minutes since the young couple left for the station. Miriam was already there. Patricia noticed her when she was seeing off the couple from the porch. Why are you snooping around here? Patricia grumbled, giving her friend a stern look. Well, I was wondering when my brilliant plan would come into action. And you took your time, Miriam replied with a hint of impatience. Who knew they would only arrive in the evening? Well, don't be so loud, it'll work for us. The young ones will settle down earlier, and you can put these poor souls in their little house. They entered the house together. Miriam looked around and made an admiring sigh. Look what you've done here. Wait, usually it's not beautiful here? Patricia grumbled again. Miriam was starting to annoy her. Why are you so nervous? I dreamt of Mario, Patricia admitted, lowering her head. Miriam even sat down on a chair in shock. After what he said, I feel like I'm making a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't deprive our daughter of love? Patricia looked into her friend's eyes, trying to find an answer. No, you're absolutely wrong. This way, you'll protect your daughter and find her a more suitable match, Miriam replied seriously. A match? Are we in the 17th century? Well, you've got me wrong. In general, you need to find her a worthy fiancé, not this useless layabout. Well, you don't even know him, Patricia said. She didn't like the tone Miriam was using with her. Do you know him? Why are you defending him at all? But Patricia didn't have a chance to answer that question. They had arrived. Patricia glared at her friend and pushed her towards the back door. Miriam was definitely not needed here now. So, Patricia was very nervous before meeting her future in-laws. Although deep down, she hoped they wouldn't be as bad as she feared. Her hands were shaking, but she took a deep breath and went to open the door. Hello. Finally, you've arrived. Patricia forced a smile. She was trying to show Joey as best she could. Please, come in. Vital's parents entered the house, and behind them came the happy young couple. Due to the twilight and excitement, Patricia couldn't see the faces of these newly arrived guests at all. Rufina immediately invited them to the dining room, and they carefully examined the interior, admiring how everything was arranged here, clean and cozy. How glad I am to see you. Well, let's get acquainted. My name is Patricia Martinez. You can just call me Patricia. The woman introduced herself, smiling broadly. I'm Aniceto, and this is my wife, Azucena. We thank you for such hospitality. 
Now Patricia could get a better look at these two. As her daughter said, their family belonged to a very small ethnicity. No one in their village had even heard of such a people, and it turned out they existed. They lived here, but their appearance resembled Asians, as they had narrow eye slits and dark hair. But here it must be acknowledged, Vital's mother looked really good, more beautiful than many young girls from their village. On the one hand, this irritated Patricia a lot. On the other hand, she involuntarily thought, what if Vidal and Rufina would have a daughter? She would probably be as beautiful as her future grandmother. But this wouldn't happen. Her daughter wouldn't marry some strange guy, a representative of such a small ethnicity that no one even knew about. What a shame. No, her daughter would marry a good, strong Spaniard. In this village, there were plenty of them. When everyone got acquainted with each other, Patricia began to set the table, salads, hot dishes, and desserts. She had prepared a lot over these three days. She didn't really want to impress these people, but Rufina asked for everything to be done in the best possible way. Patricia just didn't want to disappoint her daughter. After an hour, they were already chatting. Then Patricia asked, So, how did you two meet? Finally, Patricia managed to ask the question that had been bothering her for a week. Her daughter, of course, was already a bit tipsy, so she didn't hold back her words. Oh, well, it's a long story. On a usual cold winter evening, Rufina, as usual, was sitting at her laptop and writing code. She was supposed to finish this project a week ago, but asked her boss for a seven-day extension. Sweetie, aren't you going to bed? The worried mother asked, entering her daughter's room. It was already two o'clock in the morning. Soon, mom. Buried in the project. Patricia closed the door not to disturb Rufina unnecessarily. An hour passed, too. The girl had already had her fifth cup of coffee, but it no longer helped her. She just desperately wanted to go to sleep. Realizing that she no longer understood what she was doing, Rufina finally laid down. The next day, she decided to go to the city to visit the office and explain the situation. No, no, and no shouted the boss i've already barely convinced our clients if you don't finish by the end of the week you're fired do what you want but create this damn game already but Ciro, it's physically impossible if you remember i started working on this project two weeks ago even though it was originally given a month and you gave it to me on such a short deadline because one of your employees decided to quit why did you dump so many extra responsibilities on me? Rufina asked indignantly. Are you going to reproach me? One more word and you'll fly out of here like a cork. I took you without a higher education and gave you a chance, even though you had no work experience at all. I trusted you and you're letting me and our company down like this. Rufina didn't bother listening to these reproaches any longer. She just gave her boss an angry look and left the office. She was really angry. Why couldn't the client wait? Did their company have so few programmers who could make this game? Why did they turn to them? To this miserable little company from which people simply ran away like rats, unable to endure such harsh working conditions. Rufina didn't plan to go back home. Otherwise, her mother would load her with various household duties again. She couldn't afford distractions now. Either she would finish the work or she would get fired. And then she wouldn't be able to move from the village to the city. Rufina decided to work in one of the cafes. She ordered a hot chocolate, took out her computer, and started working. This time, everything was going well. She had done a significant amount of work when the irreparable happened. There was a short circuit and her ancient laptop shut down. She almost screamed at this damn cafe. Rufina continued to stare at the dark screen of her dead computer and tried to breathe calmly and steadily. Now all her work was going to hell. All two weeks, all sleepless nights, just went to waste. She tried to turn on the laptop, but, of course, it no longer started. Then Rufina couldn't take it and started hitting it with her hands. All the cafe visitors began to look at her, and her nerves just gave up. One of the cafe patrons noticed this. 
He was sitting behind the girl, watching the whole situation. When Rufina started to hit her laptop, the guy couldn't stand it and approached the poor thing. Miss, please calm down, he said in a cold but simultaneously soothing tone. Calm down? Rufina screamed. Are you telling me to calm down? Yes, all my work has just gone down the drain. My whole life has collapsed. I'm facing dismissal, and you're telling me to calm down? Yes, please, answered the stranger. I saw everything. Your laptop just short-circuited. It's not dead yet, unless you want to finish it off, he said with a slight smile. The girl relaxed a bit from his words. She started hoping for a better outcome. She gave the guy her seat, and he began to press something on the computer keys. After a few seconds, the laptop started as if by magic. Oh my god! exclaimed Rufina in admiration. How did you do that? Skillful hands and no trickery, the guy replied with a smile. Rufina sat back down and opened the program, praying that nothing would crash. And, miraculously, all her work was saved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. She repeated, losing her head this time from joy. I don't know how to thank you. Well, you can go for a walk with me, the stranger suggested shyly. Rufina looked at him in confusion. She expected anything, but certainly not this. However, this guy turned out to be so charming. In general, one walk doesn't mean anything. Maybe he would become her friend and help her resurface from the bottom she fell into with this damn job. Where? Rufina asked. She decided not to give an exact answer right away, let the guy suffer a bit. For example, here and now. See that courtyard across the street? He asked. Yes, I see, the girl replied affirmatively. Well, let's go there right now. Wait, what's going on? Rufina didn't understand. She hadn't even had time to comprehend what had happened, and she was already being invited somewhere by some unknown IT guy whom she didn't expect to meet here at all. I don't even know your name. It's easy to fix. My name is Vidal, said this amazing guy. Rufina stared at him with wide eyes, pretending to be clueless. Several seconds passed in silence, and then Vidal said, I'm absolutely not interested in your name if you care about that. I just want to take a walk and have good company. And I'm not asking for more. Rufina didn't say another word. She simply put her laptop in her backpack, put on her jacket, and left the cafe. Vidal followed her. It's chilly today, don't you think? Putting on gloves and squinting at the sun. I don't think talking about the weather will lead us anywhere, Rufina smiled. They headed towards the courtyard Vidal had pointed to five minutes ago. Anything is possible, you know. We've known each other for five minutes, and I've already figured out that you're a weak person. Weak? Rufina was offended by such a description. Yes, you're weak. Instead of thinking rationally and finding a solution to the problem, you started to get angry. And now you're giving up too, saying that talking about the weather is pointless. You don't know what you're talking about, and for me, everything is very logical. You don't even know what I've been through in the last few weeks. Well, I think from your reaction, your psyche is very unstable. So if you work for the company, the boss scolds you a lot for your mistakes. Am I right? Rufina thought. She wanted to object, but all the words Vidal spoke turned out to be true. You're a psychic. The girl admitted defeat. No, I just know how to draw conclusions, replied the guy arrogantly. You're such a snob, Rufina couldn't stand it. Are you the coolest guy in this city? Let me guess. You have your own business, a car, a house, or a yacht. Why do you assume that? You answered too arrogantly, Rufina noticed, not hiding her irritation. They finally reached the park. The wind was blowing from side to side, howling like a dog that had lost its owner. And Rufina thought to herself that this cold northern wind would carry her away any moment now. How much she wished to get rid of all the problems. I'm not a snob, Vidal explained more calmly. I'm sorry if it seemed that way. 
Silence fell. Only the cries and laughter of children playing on the square disturbed this winter idol. Suddenly, the guy asked, What were you writing on your laptop that, when it turned off, you almost killed yourself? Rufina blushed a little at such a question. Did she really make such an impression on people? Now they would definitely consider her crazy. But, for the most part, she didn't care. She got angry, and that's normal when things are going downhill. It's a project I've been working on for two weeks. My boss ordered me to finish it by the end of this week, Rufina explained. But it seems I'm facing dismissal. Why? I can't handle such a huge amount of work. Let's start with the fact that this heavy burden was literally dumped on me. Because one of our employees suddenly quit. Well, and the boss decided to give me such a punishment. I don't know what else to call it. In a word, he hates me. Yes, you have a tough job, the doll could only say. During the conversation, he hadn't looked at the girl once. Was she really that ugly? Or was he not interested in her appearance? Then why was he here? Why was he so interested in her work? And what do you do for a living? Rufina tried to liven up this dull dialogue. She tried to keep up with the guy, but it was difficult due to the difference in height. He was almost twice as tall as her. I'm also a kind of programmer, or rather, I used to be. Now I have my own company. We make games and collaborate with various platforms. In general, I can't complain about life. You're lucky, Rufina said, trying to hint that he was bragging too much. I don't think so, Vidal replied seriously. I achieved all this through hard work. If you think my parents provided for me, you're wrong. My parents are just ordinary people from a distant northern village. They just gave me a laptop for Christmas once, and I got into this field. Well, as you can see, now I'm thriving here. Rufina realized that she shouldn't have said the word lucky. It's a very offensive word if used in the wrong context. After all, people often achieve everything on their own. No money or success falls from the sky for them. One just has to pull themselves together and go towards their goal. People like that always motivated Rufina. They had a special energy, a strength of spirit, something inspiring, even though she never noticed any interest in their eyes. Maybe she just looked into the wrong eyes. I can help you with your project, the stranger suddenly offered. Excuse me? Rufina was almost stunned by such a question. Well, you say you don't have enough time, you might get fired. And here I am, telling you about my success. Really, do you want some help? Well, no way. Rufina firmly declined. If the boss finds out, I won't just be fired. He'll manage to do a million more nasty things to me. Well, as you wish. They reached the other end of the courtyard and said their goodbyes. Rufina returned home, and by midnight, something dawned on her. Enough. Enough with it. Enough enduring this terrible treatment, this job. She was tired of always receiving nothing but reprimands and completing incomprehensible tasks for a meager salary. Normal people were given a month or more for projects, and she was given two weeks. Therefore, after sleeping on this thought the next day, Rufina submitted her resignation letter. Ciro is very busy right now, the boss's secretary with a well-endowed bust replied. It was evident she wasn't clever, she just had a doll-like face with makeup on it. Of course, Ciro chose her not for these qualities at all. Rather, what was important to him was the form. What difference did it make who brought him coffee to the office? Even if it was a candidate in the sciences, it wouldn't matter that much. Therefore, the boss settled for this more pleasing option. I really need to see him. I think he'll give me a minute, Rufina explained with a smile and walked into the office, ignoring the angry look from the secretary. Rufina knocked on the double door of the anteroom. Ciro was indeed talking to someone. Another man was in the office. They were arguing about something. Rufina decided there was no point in eavesdropping. She almost burst into the office since her knocks were ignored. Rufina, what are you doing here? The boss snapped. He was standing behind his desk 
and there was another man sitting across from him. Rufina couldn't see his face because he was facing away. And he didn't even turn around to find out who came in and disrupted their meeting. Now, this could really be called ignoring the situation. Rufina looked at the boss again. He had an annoyed expression and was in a terrible mood. Maybe he'd be pleased with the news that she no longer worked there. She took a deep breath to prepare for the battle and confidently approached the desk. She almost threw her resignation letter in front of him and was watching Ciro's reaction. What's this? He asked in confusion. Shock, mixed with incomprehension, froze on his face. I want to quit, Rufina declared proudly. Rufina, let's save it for later. The boss tried to calm her down, pointing to the client. Can't you see I have a client here? Rufina glanced at the client, and her mouth dropped open in astonishment. She couldn't utter a word until the guy sitting across from her was also terribly surprised by this situation. Rufina? The guy exclaimed. Vidal? The girl repeated his words. Can someone explain to me what the hell is going on here? The boss couldn't take it anymore. Ciro, a flustered Rufina, began to explain, but Vidal interrupted her. You have no right to fire her. He suddenly shouted at Rufina's boss. The man was surprised by the client's behavior. The whole situation was driving him crazy. Me? Who's firing her? Ciro protested. Have you even seen what happened? She submitted her resignation herself. Because she knew you'd fire her if she didn't finish a project. The one you forced her to complete alone in two weeks. Vidal, this is your order. The boss blurted out. The room fell silent instantly. Only the clock reminded them that time was passing. Wait, I don't understand anything, Vidal finally said in complete confusion. I don't understand either, Ciro continued to protest. Hold on. Rufina shouted over the men. I'll explain everything. Ciro. Then she realized that her boss already knew her conversation partner's name. We accidentally met him yesterday in a cafe, and I couldn't even think he was our client. Then what does your resignation have to do with it? The boss asked. I realized that I couldn't handle the responsibilities. I just don't have enough time. I dedicate all my free time to work, you see? I can't even spare a minute just to live. What nonsense are you talking about? The boss exclaimed. I'm sorry, Rufina blushed and lowered her eyes. In short, I've decided to quit. I think you can find an employee better than me. How much more time do you need to finish? Vidal suddenly asked with a serious expression. A week, for sure. Then I extend my deadline, just don't quit. But, Vidal, the documents clearly state Ciro was about to object, but the client interrupted him with a gesture. My lawyers will fix this inaccuracy. I repeat, I'm extending the deadline, the guy explained calmly. Rufina looked at him as if he were her savior, appearing out of nowhere. She threw a random glance in the mirror and saw her face there, beaming with a wide smile. She immediately told herself to suppress this extra emotion. It was definitely inappropriate right now. Why did you do that? Rufina asked when they left the office. I know what it's like to look for a new job. I've been through it many times, and believe me, it's insanely difficult, Ciro explained. Rufina almost ran to keep up with his wide stride. How can I thank you? You can go on a date with me, the guy said, then fell silent. His eyes seemed to widen. Oh, sorry. I said something stupid. I must be tired. Rufina smiled. Now Vidal didn't look as insensitive as she saw him yesterday or in the office. He was, after all, vulnerable, very vulnerable. Rufina realized that, of course, he didn't say that just like that. Such words simply cannot be uttered accidentally. I would go, the girl whispered shyly. The doll suddenly stopped, and Rufina did the same. The guy looked into her ocean blue eyes, trying to find the truth in them. He couldn't believe that she could respond like that. A cheerful and lively girl like her would never even look at such a gloomy grumbler like him. 
Perhaps it would have been like that if not for that incident in the cafe that brought them together forever. Well, that's the story, Rufina concluded enthusiastically, taking another sip of strong coffee. It's so romantic. Azucena exclaimed, wiping her moist cheeks with a handkerchief. The doll, why didn't you tell us earlier? Rufina and I agreed it would be a surprise for both families, the guy smiled, looking at his beloved. But she wasn't looking at him, as sleep was already overwhelming her. She even yawned several times. I think Rufina and I will go to bed. What do you say, sweetheart? The guy asked his future wife. Upon waking from her dreams, she stirred and said, What? Oh. Yes, we'll go to bed. Mom, please make sure our guests are comfortable at night. Of course, dear. Don't doubt me, Patricia said with a smile, already planning her course of action in her head. For now, everything was going as planned. Patricia spent about an hour chatting with her new acquaintances. They shared a bit about their lives. Oh, but your Rufina is just a wonderful girl. I met you, and now I see where she got it from. Azucena admired repeatedly. Patricia felt embarrassed. According to the rules of politeness, she had to reply. Your son is also just amazing. They look so good together. They continued exchanging pleasantries for a while, and finally, it was time for a genuinely interesting conversation, the topic of which was where they would have to spend the night. I'm embarrassed to say this, Patricia said, looking down, we have only one guest room, but it's all cluttered. If my daughter had told me about your arrival a little earlier, I would have cleared it, of course. I'm very sorry that it turned out this way. It's okay, Azucena replied with understanding. We just need a place to sleep anywhere. At this point, Patricia almost celebrated her victory. She had a smirk on her face, signaling triumph. These people had chosen their fate. All Patricia had to do was offer. And, of course, the woman didn't miss this chance. You know, I have an idea. Patricia exclaimed. I have a great warm barn in the backyard. The animals won't bother you, and there's soft hay there. Patricia expected some lively reaction or even protest, but their faces remained calm. This surprised Patricia. She thought the guests were shocked by what they heard and that they were too drunk. How do you like my idea? Patricia asked quietly and uncertainly when the silence began to get on her nerves. We agree. Aniceto exclaimed with enthusiasm. Patricia smiled at him, although she didn't quite understand why he was so happy. But she wasn't too worried about it anymore, as they wouldn't be here tomorrow. The barn was quite close to the house, but it still took about two minutes to get there. When Patricia opened the doors, they immediately felt the heavy smell of cows. The building was quite large, accommodating two cows, a chicken with roosters, and even a horse that Mario had once won in cards. He was incredibly lucky that day. Patricia initially wanted to sell the horse, but her husband didn't want to part with the creature, and the decision was made to keep the horse. Rufina used to ride the horse occasionally as she grew up, but with each passing year, she became more engrossed in work and soon forgot about her faithful friend. The horse was only occasionally taken out for a walk. Patricia was angry that she had to feed and take care of it, although it brought no benefit. But this animal held the memory of Mario. And, of course, neither Patricia nor Rufina would ever sell it. The smell of animals didn't bother the guests at all. They walked as if nothing had happened. This greatly irritated Patricia. Couldn't they see or smell clearly? Well, Patricia uttered, not knowing what to say in such situations. Today you can sleep here. Thank you, hostess. Azucena suddenly exclaimed and hugged Patricia tightly, smiling. Patricia was standing with rounded eyes. She didn't understand why these people had such a strange reaction. But instead of prying into the motives of the slightly intoxicated guests, she simply wished them a good night and went home. That night, she couldn't sleep. It felt like she had just made a terrible mistake. She worried about how her daughter would take it. What if she finds out everything? No, that cannot be allowed. Such thoughts haunted Patricia the entire remaining night. 
Of course, by morning, she was a wreck. When she woke up, she smelled the freshly brewed coffee. This seemed like an alarming sign from the beginning. Rufina wouldn't make coffee if they had quarreled with Vidal. Patricia got out of bed, quickly put on her robe, and ran downstairs to find out what had already happened. She was mentally prepared for a scandal and hoped that everything would pass quickly and as painlessly as possible. She walked through the corridor straight to the kitchen. There, her daughter and future son-in-law were already standing. Mom! Rufina exclaimed joyfully. Finally, you're awake. Why so late? Breakfast has been on the table for a long time. Patricia didn't understand anything. Why was her daughter in such high spirits? She expected that curses and fists would rain down on her and Rufina would throw herself at her in hysteria. But everything was too calm. There was a genuine idol in the kitchen. Patricia, Vidal said, I am so grateful to you for your service. Patricia didn't understand anything at all, so she couldn't give a coherent answer. What are you talking about? She asked a difficult question in a quiet voice, sitting down at the dining table. Rufina served her breakfast scrambled eggs with bacon. It was her favorite breakfast. Surprisingly, Rufina rarely cooked it. Maybe there was poison in it. Perhaps her daughter decided to retaliate against her nasty mother in this way? Thank you, I'm not hungry. She immediately replied to her daughter and pushed the plate with the delicious food away. Rufina looked at her as if she were crazy or sick. The girl was about to ask why her mother didn't want to eat, but she didn't have time. The doll started the conversation. Well, Patricia, how about that? My parents are immensely grateful to you for the honor you've bestowed upon them. They've never experienced such a warm welcome. Patricia thought that it was pure sarcasm by now and even smirked, preparing to fend off the blow. She was about to reply when Azucena and Aniceto entered the room. The man had a straw stuck in his hair, but the faces of both were happier than those of sleeping babies. Patricia completely didn't understand anything. Why was everyone so happy today? After all, last night, she had done such a nasty thing. Ideally, these in-laws should have left on their own yesterday, as soon as Patricia suggested they sleep in the barn. Patricia, Azucena smiled. She approached the woman and hugged her tightly again, just like yesterday, before going to bed. Patricia almost broke free from these hugs and looked at a surprised Azucena. I'm sorry, maybe I'm allowing myself too much, said Azucena, realizing her mistake. They were not yet friends enough to violate each other's personal space like this. We just really appreciate your warm welcome, Azucena continued. Excuse me? Patricia asked again. Will someone please explain to me what's going on here? She couldn't help but say, sounding strained and plaintive. How so? Azucena was amazed. You studied our traditions, and how could you find out in such a short time that our ancestors slept in the barn a long time ago? And since then, such a reception is considered the epitome of hospitality. We are such small people, there is absolutely no information about us on the internet. Few people know that our ancestors used to live in chums with domestic animals and warmed themselves with the animal's heat during long winter evenings. It's so nice, you can't even imagine. Thank you for your hospitality. I didn't expect you to take such good care of us. That joke about the guest room was just an excuse, right? You just wanted to find a suitable pretext for us to spend the night in the barn. How sweet of you. Azucena, overwhelmed with emotions, hugged her future relative again. Patricia was simply shocked by the information she had just received. She didn't expect that hosting guests in the barn was something honorable. It seemed that now she had only worsened the situation. From now on, Vital's parents will always thank her for this deed, although everything was supposed to happen completely the other way around. I, Patricia said, I'm very glad you liked it. I wanted to make such a small surprise, she lied. It's nice that you liked it. An awkward silence ensued, only interrupted by the flow of water from the tap. Rufina was washing the dishes and observing the whole situation. Now she was terribly proud of her mother. 
Patricia, knowing almost nothing, found information about tradition somewhere. She wasn't just a mom, she was a real hero. One could say that the acquaintance between the two families had gone successfully. Rufina said that you can take a nice walk around here, we'll take our son. We'll leave you, so to speak, alone, Azucena said with a hint. Feel free to discuss us. What are you saying? Patricia feigned indignation, and both women laughed. But somehow, Azucena was right, Patricia really wanted to discuss them. So, as soon as the family went out the door, Patricia rushed to the kitchen with her daughter. Mom, I'm so glad you accepted my choice. Rufina said, smiling. I thought you would disapprove. You always told me it's better to choose a partner of our own kind, and here I found someone from a completely different tribe, so to speak, she laughed. Patricia only gave her a strained smile for a moment. The woman couldn't believe that her entire plan had failed. Now her daughter would definitely marry that Chinese guy. She wanted to cry, but she couldn't show these weaknesses to her daughter. She had just praised her mother so much and rejoiced so much. I'm happy for you, my dear, Patricia said with a sigh. His parents are very nice people, and he's a well-mannered and polite young man. Why do you sound so disappointed? Sorry, didn't sleep well tonight. Maybe I shouldn't have drunk so much wine yesterday. Rufina just smiled, and their conversation ended there. Soon, Rufina went to her room to finish some urgent work, and Patricia went out onto the porch to get some fresh air. Birds were singing outside, children were passing by, life went on. Suddenly, Patricia noticed an unfamiliar figure not far away, she was getting closer. So, did you get rid of them? Miriam asked, smirking. Yes, what's the use? Nothing worked, your plan didn't work. It turns out that in their homeland, it is considered the highest sign of hospitality, Patricia replied, lowering her head. Miriam laughed. Yeah, I know. How? Patricia wondered. Well, they went for a walk in our little village, and I was just in the garden. I see strangers coming. I immediately understood that they were your in-laws. Do you know what they did there? What? Patricia got worried. Come on, calm down. Nothing terrible for them, for sure. They just told everyone around them about your feet and the nobility of your act. Oh, and by the way, they invited almost every person in the village to the wedding as well. What? Shouted Patricia's mother in amazement. She certainly did not expect such a turn of events. Oh, don't worry. Nobody cares about your wedding. At most, five people will come. But it's good to have more people around. Patricia sat on the bench and almost cried. Hey, what's wrong with you? Miriam asked, sitting down next to her. I don't want this damn wedding. Who knew they had such stupid traditions? The poor woman cried. Hey, you just... Suddenly, they saw them. The doll and his parents finally returned home after their walk. It was clear from their faces that everything went very well. Patricia noticed that they were carrying something black in their hands. They approached the porch and stopped. They were staring at Patricia, as if inviting her to come closer. Patricia looked back at the surprised Miriam and approached her future relatives. For your kindness, we want to give you this present. Azucena said and handed the woman the dark brown furs of some animal. The sable furs, the woman explained. They are the rarest, and you can make an excellent winter coat from them. Patricia was shocked by such a gift. She had never been given furs or anything like that before. Sometimes she even felt nauseous when she saw fur that had recently been on a living being. But suppressing her reflex, she politely thanked them and offered them lunch. The next day, Vital's parents left, and only the groom stayed in the house. And the wedding was just around the corner, less than a week away. During this time, Rufina had already picked out a dress for herself, flowers, and chosen the venue for the ceremony. It was Patricia who suggested celebrating the wedding at their village registro civil. It offered services for outdoor registration. Moreover, everything would be official, 
but not in the registry office building or anywhere within the district center. Rufina, of course, immediately accepted this proposal. It sounded very beautiful and romantic. They would have a wedding like in the movies. Wasn't it a dream? Also, Rufina chose a bridesmaid. She didn't have really close girlfriends, but she had many acquaintances there in the village. But Rufina didn't stop at just any girl. It was Miriam's daughter, Rosalia. Miriam was overjoyed. Her daughter would be the bridesmaid of honor. She almost every day went to Patricia's house to admire Rufina's choice once again. Rufina made the right choice after all, she said. My Rosalia will be perfect as the bridesmaid of honor. Well, just wonderful. How happy I am that your daughter is getting married, Patricia. I'm so happy too, Patricia replied without any emotion, chopping onions. She had already reconciled herself to the fact that she would have relatives who looked like Asians. However, every day, she tried to come up with a reason to somehow sabotage this marriage. But nothing came to mind. It was simply impossible to find fault with Vidal. He was so well-mannered that he helped his future mother-in-law with everything, cooking, cleaning, the garden, the vegetable patch, and taking care of the livestock. Rufina watched all of this and was proud of her fiancé. She definitely made the right choice. And so, all preparations were complete. The legendary day had arrived. The building where the marriage ceremony was to take place was designed in the Spanish style. It was a genuine Baroque estate. Rufina was over the moon with happiness. Guests had already started arriving, and Rufina sat in her room, where they were doing her makeup and putting on the dress. Do you want to curl on this side or that side? Asked the stylist whom Rufina had hired from the city. To the right. I want the left side to be open. It's my good side. Rufina smiled. Suddenly, an agitated Patricia entered the room. Everyone leave. I urgently need to talk to my daughter. She shouted. Everyone looked at her strangely, but still complied with this nervous request. Mom? Rufina looked at her mother in confusion. What are you doing here? Did something happen? It did, sweetheart. Rufina stood up from the chair and approached her mother with a lump in her throat. Come on, speak, pleaded the daughter. Darling, I honestly don't know how to tell you this, Patricia said, averting her eyes to the lower left corner. Mom, speak. He, he. Just say it. He was kissing another girl, Rufina. Patricia finally blurted out. Shock froze in her eyes, and Rufina, upon hearing this, collapsed onto the couch. She felt so sick, breathing became heavy. Her eyes stared into emptiness, and her heart pounded wildly. No, she whispered. He couldn't. You must be mistaken. Darling, sympathetically uttered Patricia, sitting on the couch next to her daughter. I understand what you're feeling right now, but... No! Rufina shouted. You're lying. This can't be. He couldn't do this to me. Rufina, sweetheart, when have I ever lied to you? Patricia asked sincerely. Everyone fell silent. Clearly, Rufina was deep in thought. Her mother had indeed never lied to her. What would be the point of doing so on her happiest day? No, her mother wouldn't act this way. After realizing this, tears streamed from Rufina's eyes and a real hysteria began. Patricia hugged her, trying to provide support, but then something unexpected happened. Rufina jumped off the couch and started tearing her pristine white wedding dress. Fabric scattered around the room as she ripped it to shreds, growling like a wild beast. After that, Rufina began to smash everything within her reach. Patricia was trying to stop her, but it seemed like her daughter was possessed by the devil. It was horrifying to watch. Makeup artists and hairdressers rushed when they heard the cries. Everyone was shocked by what was happening. Attempts were made to calm her down. Eventually, when she realized there was nothing more to do, Rufina darted out of the room like an arrow, then out of the building. The doll didn't even have time to comprehend it because she ran past him like a flash. Guests turned around, chaos ensued. Before this, Vidal was talking to his father, and now he was completely bewildered. 
He was trying to get an answer from those who ran out of the dressing room, but they just shrugged. She had a hysterical fit. She destroyed everything around her, tore her dress, and ran away, explained the hairstylist, panting. The doll exchanged glances with his father. His father was smiling, but it was an eerie smile that sent shivers down the spine. The doll didn't say anything. He just ran after his distraught bride. In the hall, there was turmoil. Some guests were discussing what was happening, and only Patricia was standing aside with eyes rounded in shock. She had lied to her daughter for the first time. She didn't expect that this news would provoke such a violent reaction. It was unexpectedly terrible. Of course, the doll hadn't betrayed Rufina and hadn't kissed anyone else, but Patricia couldn't calm down. Now she was trying to find any way out. This wedding must not happen. Dear guests, announced Aniceto, stepping onto the stage. The bride just had pre-wedding hysteria. It happens to everyone. But I want to reassure you. According to our centuries-old traditions, the groom must catch the bride before the wedding as if she were prey. And as you can see, our traditions are being faithfully followed. Everything is going according to plan. The guests applauded. It's worth noting that among the guests, an equal number were from the grooms and bride's sides. It seemed they were pleased with the situation. While Patricia was standing by a wooden post, Miriam approached her, holding a glass of champagne. It will be a lively wedding. I'm already enjoying their wild contests, she laughed. Yes, these aren't any contests, Patricia sighed. It's my fault. What did you tell her? That Vidal was kissing another girl. Surprise froze in Miriam's eyes. It seemed she was about to drop her glass. What? Why would you do that? Patricia's friend protested. You know why. I'm grasping at any opportunity. I don't want to. I can't accept this. No matter how good he is, I'll never be able to see him as my daughter's husband. Hold on. Miriam interrupted. He's not your husband, right? Your daughter has to make a choice now. And only she has the right to decide who she wants to marry. They could have found her a good match here. She would have tolerated it and grown to love him. No, they wouldn't have. Miriam continued to protest. She met this man and fate brought them together. So, that's how it should be. There's no other way. Stop being so principled. What? Patricia exclaimed. You wanted to help me with this. It was you who suggested that darn dirty barn, right? But then I realized it's Rufina's life, Miriam insisted. Only she will decide who to marry and who to send away. You changed your mind quickly, Patricia retorted discontentedly and walked away. She didn't want to talk to Miriam anymore. While Miriam was on her side, as soon as her daughter became the center of attention, priorities changed. No, this wasn't how it was supposed to be. Patricia still hoped that Vidal wouldn't be able to explain the whole situation to his bride. And just as she thought about that guy, he appeared right there. Rufina wasn't with him, which was a good sign for Patricia. But things weren't that straightforward. Vidal approached his father and led him aside to keep their conversation truly confidential. I didn't find her, but I heard something, Vidal whispered to his father, who perked up. When I left the registry office, I looked around and saw two hairstylists. They were smoking, and I accidentally overheard their conversation. It turns out that while Rufina was getting ready, her mother interrupted her and kicked everyone out of that room. But one hairstylist overheard it by the door. Rufina's mom told her that I supposedly cheated on her and that I kissed another girl. His father's eyes almost popped out. He certainly didn't expect such nonsense from Patricia. I think she just wants our wedding to cancel, the doll continued whispering. I know I said I don't like our traditions, but is there any custom that involves hiding a scandalous mother-in-law far away? So she doesn't interfere with us on this day? He asked with a hint of a sly smile. His father understood the hint and winked at him. Vidal smiled in return as a gesture of gratitude and rushed to find his missing bride, who was struck by groundless jealousy. 
Meanwhile, Aniceto went to implement his idea of temporarily getting rid of Patricia, who was obstructing the wedding. The man stepped onto the stage and announced, Dear friends, he proudly declared, As you can see, our groom is currently following tradition. Well, to keep us from getting bored, I suggest having a bit of fun. Everyone supported him with silence, and Aniceto continued. So, I propose that each of you tell some interesting stories about what happened to our young couple. Surely you have something in mind? Laughter echoed in the hall. Of course, many new embarrassing stories, as there were Vital's friends, relatives, and also people from Rafina's side who were ready to share interesting stories. But for some reason, no one wanted to answer such an interesting question. Then Aniceto said, Let's start with you. He said, pointing to Patricia, who was sitting at the end of the hall. All the guests turned to her, and she blushed. Well, then, the woman pondered. I have such a story. They handed her a microphone, and she began her story. It was a long time ago. Rufina was studying in high school and wanted to enroll in the theater university. At that time, I had acquaintances who were teachers at universities precisely in that field. So, I called one of them. He suggested having a conversation with the girl to immediately find out if she had the aptitude for this activity or not. Rufina was terribly nervous before his arrival, memorized five poems, and did make up. In general, she did everything she could so that he would choose her. Finally, Pedro Iglesias managed to visit us. My daughter and I set the table and seated him. We engaged in a wonderful conversation. The teacher noted that she had a very good speech and a rich vocabulary. In general, there were high hopes that she would be accepted into that acting school. And then, at one point, Rufina decided to bring a cake of her own making and coffee. She left us in the dining room and headed to the kitchen. She poured coffee into cups, arranged everything on a tray, and placed the cake in the center, a delicious one with cream. She carried the tray into the dining room with all its contents, and suddenly, right under her feet, a banana peel appeared. God knows why it was there. In general, that tray overturned right onto Pedro. The hot coffee scalded his pants, and the cake hit him right in the face. Can you believe it? All the guests burst into laughter. The end of this story is obvious, Patricia continued with a smile. Pedro was so furious that he rushed out of our house like a bullet. Rufina didn't leave her bed for three days, and she cried. She said it was her most shameful story in life, and I vowed not to tell anyone about it. But today is a special day. Everyone applauded. Patricia was amazed that she could entertain people. Although, in principle, it wasn't difficult, many were already in a cheerful mood. Well, Aniceto began to sum up, I don't think anyone has a funnier story. Personally, I don't have one about my son, for sure. He never did anything very funny or embarrassing in front of me. I think all of this happened in the circle of his friends. And so, let's acknowledge that Patricia has the best story about young Rufina. The guests applauded again. And of course, Aniceto continued, there must be prizes in every contest. We, of course, have them too. He gestured to Azucena, and she pulled out a white fawn from somewhere. Yes, indeed, this thing looked like a white fawn. She handed it to Patricia, and Aniceto explained. This is a carved ibex tusk with our traditional drink. Drink it carefully. He laughed. But since you have such an amazing story, we are ready to give you our drink in a regular bottle. It's really delicious, try it. Out of politeness, Patricia took a sip of this rare drink. Indeed, it was very sweet, with a hint of alcohol, but not much. It rather resembled something tasty, like cranberry tincture. But Patricia was wrong. Fifteen minutes later, her head was spinning, and after thirty minutes, the woman fell asleep. She sat in a sleeping state in the back rows, and no one paid attention to her, everyone was already a little tipsy, and the brides were still nowhere to be seen. Could it be that the wedding wouldn't take place after all? Somewhere a kilometer away, the doll was looking for his runaway bride. 
and where could she disappear to? But finally, he saw her. Rufina was sitting on a bench. Her white silhouette from a distance looked more like a ghost. The doll approached her carefully and sat down gently, not to startle her. Pitiful sobs could be heard, and Rufina hid her face in her hands. Rufina, her boyfriend, called softly. I know you don't want to hear me right now, but I want you to know. Your mother lied to you. I haven't kissed anyone. I haven't cheated on you. The sobs stopped. Rufina turned her head, her eyes crystalline from tears. Mascara ran, and all the makeup was ruined. How dare you speak ill of my mother? The bride exclaimed. She has never lied to me. And I have? Silence. It seemed that Rufina realized she was in a deadlock. She felt emptiness inside, and now doubt was added to it. What if her mother really lied? Why would my mom lie to me? She asked tearfully. The thing is, she doesn't want me to become your husband. What? Rufina was astonished. Now her eyes were filled more with shock and curiosity. They told me everything. Well, in general. Your mother is just against our wedding. I don't know why, but she fiercely tries to sow discord between us. Mom has never been against you. On the contrary, she said you were so well-mannered and good. I made a wonderful choice. So, she lied. Sweetheart, do you really think I could cheat on you? We've been dating for a year, keeping our relationship a secret until the wedding. Can I really betray you? Rufina pondered. The doll never gave her a reason to be jealous, let alone think about infidelity. If everything was indeed like this, then the problem was with her mother. Why would she do this? Rufina was terribly angry with Patricia. How could she do such a thing? All those sweet words about what a good groom she had all lies. She lied to her. I hate her, Rufina muttered through gritted teeth. The doll finally mustered the courage to embrace her shoulders and say, Take it easy, my dear. Regardless of who that woman is, she's your mother. She always wants what's best for you. She just ruined my wedding. She managed to spoil the best day of my life. Rufina screamed in anger. Quiet, don't raise your voice like that, Vidal requested. Nothing is ruined yet, everyone is waiting for us. Did you see me? Did you see my dress? My hairstyle looks like a nest, and my eyes look like a demon's. We can fix everything as soon as you let us, reassured her fiancé. How? Just come with me. Finally, Vidal managed to persuade the girl to return to the civil registry. Rufina's makeup was fixed, as was her hairstyle. The main problem was the dress. It was so torn that nothing could be changed. Even a homeless person wouldn't dare to wear such a wretched thing. The dress seemed as if birds had pecked at it and wild animals had torn it apart. Rufina regretted getting so angry at that moment. This is the end, Vidal. Cancel the wedding. I can't go through with it, she said, surrendering. They were sitting in the room on the couch, trying to come up with some way out of the situation. No, it's not the end, came the voice of Vidal's mother, who suddenly entered the room. She held a black cover in her hands. When the woman noticed Rufina's gaze, she smiled, teasingly waving it in front of the couple. Try this on, dear, she said, handing Rufina the black cover. She was astonished by this strange offer. And you, groom, she sternly addressed her son, please, leave. We've already broken tradition. The groom shouldn't see the bride until the altar. To hell with your traditions, he whispered quietly. Luckily, no one heard that. The guy just stood up and left the dressing room. Rufina followed her departing groom, then threw her scrutinizing gaze at the black case. Of course, she opened it immediately. As she suspected, there was a white wedding dress inside. Rufina carefully took it out of the protective case and began examining it. I wore this dress to my wedding. I wanted to give it to my daughter, but God blessed me with only a son. I think fate itself suggested who needs this dress now, Azucena explained with a smile. The dress was stunning, with no frills. 
Beautiful lace adorned it, and the back was open. Why did Nazusina bring it earlier? It was breathtaking. Rufina hastily began undressing, and Azucena helped her put on this wonderful garment. On Rufina's figure, it looked even more elegant. Rufina would wear it every day if she had the chance. It fit her perfectly. It's like it's tailor-made for you, Azucena exclaimed. It was genuinely a heartfelt compliment. She was thrilled with her future daughter-in-law. Thank you. Rufina exclaimed joyfully and rushed into the arms of her future mother-in-law. Quiet, quiet. Azucena laughed. You might tear that too. In that case, we'll definitely have to cancel the wedding. Okay, I'll go tell them that you're ready now. Meanwhile, Vidal approached his father. They shook hands and smiled. Well, did you find your lost love? Aniceto asked with a laugh. I did. It was challenging, but at least your tradition with mom is upheld, the doll remarked with evident good humor. How is our home record doing? Aniceto glanced behind his son. The guy turned around and saw the sleeping woman at the back of the hall. It's a pity she'll miss her daughter's wedding, the doll said sarcastically. Suddenly, they noticed Azucena running towards them at full speed. She approached and, catching her breath, said, well, the bride is ready, let's start already. Everyone immediately busied themselves, Aniceto signaled to the main hosts and organizers. The host announced, Dear guests, please take your seats. The wedding ceremony is about to begin. Rufina was sitting in her room, waiting to be called. She always wanted her mother to accompany her to the altar. But today, her dreams shattered against harsh reality. She wiped a tear from her cheek and proudly and confidently walked towards the exit. Today was her day, and she didn't care about her mother. Rufina was about to leave when the door swung open abruptly, and in the corridor, the girl saw her. I want to accompany you, she announced. She said it with such maternal warmth and understanding that Rufina couldn't refuse. This woman truly seemed like an angel. She saved this day. Azucena took Rufina by the arm and led her to the aisle. Although it was a rural house, everything was decorated very modernly. Vidal's parents didn't spare any expense on his wedding, but it should be noted that Vidal himself could afford it. The couple could have organized the wedding in the city, but there was a reason to do it here. This place was special to Rufina. Her entire life unfolded here, birth, school, work, and she continued to live here. These familiar fields, forests, and lakes also lived in her soul. Vidal, on the other hand, didn't particularly love his hometown. He moved out of his parents' house at 16, and by 20, he could already afford to buy an apartment in a big city. But life is always unpredictable, and here he was, in love with a simple village girl. Or maybe not so simple. Could Rufina be called simple? Not every village person excels in programming or the world of technology. Therefore, the young couple considered this place perfect, a real dream, everyone dreams of celebrating a wedding in nature. The ceremony began, and music was playing. It was a true delight for the ears. Rufina was thrilled. Walking with Azucena on the red carpet, all eyes were on her. At that moment, she felt like the happiest person on earth. The doll looked at her with admiring eyes. He couldn't believe that this girl was marrying him. It seemed to him that he wasn't even worthy of her. She was smart and beautiful. She was not just beautiful, but she seemed to radiate rays of otherworldly light. How could one dress transform her so drastically? The doll thanked God that Rufina tore her wedding dress. Otherwise, he would have never seen how well she suited her mother's dress. Azucena, too, cried tears of happiness. She was delighted with everything. The woman even allowed herself to shed a few tears. And now, the most decisive moment has arrived. Azucena let go of Rufina's hand, and she walked to the altar. She even thought Vidal was crying. But the guy quickly regained his composure. The angelic music faded away, and silence fell in the hall. The wedding registrar, a young brunette with glasses and a dazzling smile, approached them. 
Good day, dear guests and newlyweds, greeted the wedding registrar. Dear bride and groom, you possess what millions seek, but only the chosen find, that is love. It is love that unites hearts, destinies, thoughts, and aspirations on the path to the great art of married life. Living for the happiness of a loved one, creating a family, this is the beginning of a noble union of two loving hearts. Today is the most beautiful and unforgettable event in your life. From this day forward, you will walk hand in hand through life, experiencing joy on happy days and sorrow in adversity. But before you say, perhaps, the most important words in your life, let me remind you that it is love, the feeling that brought you together, that will forever remain an unchanging guarantee of your happiness. And now, in the presence of your dear and close ones, I ask you, Vidal, do you agree to take Rafina as your wife? To be with her in joy and sorrow, in wealth and poverty, in sickness and health, until death separates you? I do, the groom sincerely replied, looking into the eyes of his bride. Rufina, do you agree to be the wife of Vidal, to be with him in joy and sorrow, in wealth and poverty, in sickness and health, until death separates you? I do. Rufina exclaimed. She couldn't wait to finally become Vidal's wife. Everyone dreams of being happy, but does everyone remember that they themselves are the creators of their own happiness? The registrar continued. Today, you embark on a new path in your family life, and only you have the power to make it happy. As a sign of the firmness of your intentions and the endlessness of love, exchange rings. After these words, Rosalia approached them and presented them with a cushion on which rested precious wedding rings made of white gold. Vidal took the ring and placed it on Rafina's ring finger, and she did the same. Now, I'll ask you to sign the marriage document, the registrar said. The couple followed her instructions, both putting their beautiful signatures on the paper. Dear spouses, the registrar pronounced, you have come to us in the name of love, uniting your destinies in the bonds of matrimony. Preserve the gift of the first happy days and carry their purity and fidelity through the long years of life. Do not lose your love amidst life's challenges and busyness. May your happiness be as bright and pure as the spring sky, as enduring as your entire life, and as beautiful as your great love. From now on, you are husband and wife. Groom, you may kiss the bride. The doll didn't need to ask much. He gently kissed his wife, and the guests applauded, many shedding tears of happiness, especially Azucena and Aniceto. Perhaps Patricia would have also rejoiced for the young couple, but today she made her own choice. The newlyweds descended from the stage. Congratulations and well wishes continued to pour in. Aniceto and Azucena approached them. Well, young ones, cheerfully began Vital's father. Now we can start the celebration. Yes, do all the guests know where to go? Vidal clarified. Of course, his father confirmed. Rufina, he addressed his daughter-in-law, does your mother know where to go, or is she not joining us? This question caught Rufina off guard. She had completely forgotten about her mother. She hadn't even looked at her during the ceremony. She felt ashamed, but on the other hand, she was to blame herself. Patricia had wanted to ruin this wedding. But now Rufina was in doubt, should she invite her to the celebration or not? We'll take Patricia with us, right? Azucena asked, noticing Rufina's distracted look. Yes, Rufina confidently replied. I think she should come with us. They began to look around to find Patricia, but she was nowhere to be seen. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Aniceto and Azucena, confident in her location, headed to the end of the hall. To their surprise, Patricia was not in her seat. She had disappeared. Father and mother started to worry. Anything could have happened to her, especially considering her state of intoxication. Have you found her? Rufina anxiously asked, approaching her husband and his father. No, they replied in disappointed unison. Where could she have gone? Rufina couldn't hold back her anxiety. The hall was nearly empty. Some guests chose not to attend the celebration and headed home. Others had already left for the address provided by Aniceto. Patricia. 
the newly acquired family members shouted, Mom! Mother! Rufina was screaming at the top of her lungs. No one responded. Rufina was beside herself. How much did she drink? Does anyone know? Rufina asked her new relatives, seemingly out of her mind. No, Vidal lied. Azucena looked at her son disapprovingly. She approached Rufina and admitted, We gave her strong moonshine. What? Rufina exclaimed in fear. We didn't know she would run off somewhere, Vidal began to defend himself. She was just supposed to be out for a few hours. We did it to make sure she didn't ruin the wedding. You got my mother drunk and didn't tell me anything about it? Rufina continued to express her outrage. Her patience was wearing thin. We thought it would be better this way. She would have spoiled everything, Rufina. Vidal justified himself. Whether she would spoil it or not, she is my mother. You told me that yourself, and now, honestly, it feels like a real betrayal, Rufina said. All right, young ones, enough arguing. We need to call the police, Aniceto said firmly, looking at the ground as if resigned to something inevitable. Police? What about the wedding? Azucena began to protest. The bride's mother is missing. Do you think it's a joke? She's drunk, anything could happen to her. Aniceto was getting angry. Aniceto is right, Rufina agreed. We need to call the police. They discussed it for another five minutes and finally came to a unanimous decision. They would call the police. They reported the situation over the phone and the officers said they would arrive in 15 minutes. For everyone, those 15 minutes felt like torture. No one could find peace. Aniceto and Vidal were haunted by guilt for what they had done. Rufina tried to hold herself together but blamed herself for all the misfortunes. Only Azucena remained calm. It seemed like nothing bothered her. In some ways, that was true. She genuinely wasn't involved in anything terrible. Eventually, the police arrived and the family rushed outside to explain what had happened. She was sitting on a chair. No one touched her and then she disappeared, Aniceto told the investigator. It's all nonsense, an old man, whose house seemed to be nearby, said. I saw where she went. Everyone became interested, especially because this old man was unknown to anyone. He wasn't invited to the wedding. He was just a passerby from the street. So, what did you see? The investigator asked, pulling out a new sheet of paper. This woman came out of the building where the wedding was. There was a commotion in the yard, so I went out to see what was happening. I see her walking towards a car, swaying. Suddenly, two guys appeared out of nowhere, threw a bag over her, and took her away. It turns out there was a car parked far away. They took away your mother-in-law. The old man grinned. I don't know where, but those were clearly not good people. Damn. Rufina swore, her troubles seemed to be never-ending. Rufina and Vidal left, while Aniceto and Azucena stayed to listen to what the investigator had to say. Well, for now, there are no leads, the police officer sadly said, studying his notes. There is, the old man said, muttering through his teeth. There was some orange graffiti on the car. Kids probably drew on it, and it didn't come off. Returning Vidal joined the conversation. I can help in the search. Mom, can you keep an eye on Rufina? Azucena's son asked. Of course, dear, she said sadly, and she went to her poor daughter-in-law. The police officer reported everything described by the old man on his radio. The next day, they found the car not far from there. Of course, there was no talk of any celebration. A large-scale investigation was underway to find Azucena's mother. The whole night and day, Rufina was on edge, frequently taking sedatives. Azucena had been by her side the entire time. Vidal also tried his best to support the poor girl. As soon as information about the discovery of the car came in, Aniceto, Vidal, and the sergeant went to the location. There was indeed orange graffiti on the car, but unfortunately, to their dismay, there was no one inside. 
Investigator Salvador attempted to trace the car by its license plate numbers, but it yielded no results. He sent the family home, and they returned empty-handed once again. They killed her. Rufina wailed. She's definitely dead. Stop it, we'll find her, her young husband reassured her. A few hours later, the investigator called on the phone. Vidal, we have a lead. We ran the data again and found the owner of this car. More precisely, this car belongs to a company. We dug deeper and learned that the owner of this firm lives in the same village. I think it's worth looking into here. Can you tell me if your mother-in-law had any connections with shady people? Me? Vidal responded uncertainly. I don't know. I don't think so. She's just an ordinary woman taking care of the household. Mostly, all the household expenses are covered by her daughter, and she also has an inheritance from her late husband. An inheritance? The investigator inquired. Okay. Don't you think someone might be after her money? I don't know, and I can't ask my wife right now. She's not in a state to think about it. I just found some information about the owner of this company. Does the name Miriam say anything to you? No, not at all. Too bad. It seems she might be Patricia's neighbor. Anyway, I'll be there in 20 minutes to explain everything. As the investigator promised, he arrived precisely in 20 minutes. He showed a photo of Miriam, but, as usual, it didn't help. So, they decided to seek assistance from Rufina. The poor girl had been in a severe mental state for two days, so Vidal warned the investigator to speak to her gently and not press too hard. They knocked on the girl's bedroom. The door was opened by the exhausted Azucena, who also felt unwell due to Rufina's mood. The investigator wants to ask Rufina something. Vidal explained his unexpected visit. Azucena let Salvador in and left them alone. Hello, Rufina, the police officer introduced himself. I need to ask you about your mother. Do you mind answering a few questions? Go ahead, Rufina replied in a grave voice. Did your mom have a significant inheritance? Well, it was enough for a living. She didn't even work when I was born. Okay, now the main question. Are you familiar with the name Miriam? Rufina perked up, and the name immediately made a huge impression on her. Yes, the girl replied. She paused and seemed to understand where the investigator was heading. Miriam also disappeared from the wedding, but her daughter was there. However, no one remembered her because she was a wallflower, and the whole evening she only talked to one person. That's Miriam. Oh my god. It's her. What about her? Can you provide more details? Miriam is my mother's friend. She didn't just wander around our house back then. She needed money. I don't know if my mother gave her anything, but please, let's check their house. Unfortunately, that's illegal. I need a warrant for that. It will take about a day to get one so we can search the house, the investigator admitted. Rufina was beside herself with rage. She was convinced that only Miriam could pull off such a nasty move. What a rat. Unfortunately, without a warrant, they couldn't get in. When Salvador left, Rufina urgently went to tell her husband about her suspicions. I'm telling you, Vidal, it's her. The girl asserted. Why are you so sure? Even the police suspect her. I just didn't tell the investigator something else. The thing is, Miriam asked for a lot of money. Okay. Why do you think so? And my mom gave it to her. Well, they signed some papers, but we don't have those papers. Mom thought she lost it, but I think Miriam didn't just wander around here all these days for nothing. She visited my mother every day. Are you saying that? Yes, that receipt is probably at her place. Maybe this piece of paper will help us in the search? Well, dear, how are we going to get to her place? A warrant is a legal method, but there are more barbaric ways, Rufina said with a smile, and Vidal understood her hint. The next day, Rufina stared out of her kitchen window. It offered the best view of the neighbor's house. 
She waited for the moment when Miriam would go somewhere, and at three in the afternoon, it happened, Miriam and her daughter went to visit someone. Rufina made sure it was true and only then called her husband. He rushed outside and sneaked into Miriam's house. The door was, of course, locked, so he had to climb through the attic skylight. Rufina waited at the front door. A few minutes later, Vidal ran to the door and opened it from the inside. Now they have officially entered the house. What do you think? How much do they give for breaking and entering? Vidal joked, trying to lighten the mood. Rufina didn't appreciate the joke. The couple immediately started rummaging through cabinets and dressers, looking for the document. It yielded no results. Then Rufina realized that this paper would hardly be lying in plain sight. Miriam had definitely hidden it somewhere. Okay, you check the sofa. I'll go to the second floor and search the bedroom, Rufina said. The spouses split up. The second floor was full of clutter and garbage. All doors were blocked by boxes, rags, and various unnecessary items. Only one door was not obstructed by anything. Rufina immediately understood that it was the bedroom they were looking for. She quietly entered and meticulously examined every speck of dust. She looked under pillows, turned over blankets, there was nothing anywhere. She decided to check the wardrobe when suddenly she heard a noise, someone was banging on something metallic. She heard distinctly human suffering. Rufina already had a suspicion about who this person was and where they were. She opened the wardrobe, pushed all the things aside, and found a hidden door in the closet. What an inventor this Miriam was. Rufina broke through the wall and found her mother there. The woman was tied up, a gag in her mouth. Unwiped tears streaked her cheeks, and the makeup made her look even more pitiful. Mom. Rufina couldn't hold back and shouted it at the top of her lungs. She immediately lifted her poor mother up. She had bruises on her hands and legs from the ropes, and a black eye showed a bruise. Rufina, I found this receipt. Vidal shouted from the first floor. Rufina ignored his cry. Right now, she had reached her goal. She had found her beloved mother. Mom, who did this to you? Rufina cried, unraveling her hands. Suddenly, there was a crash from below, and Rufina's eyes widened. Vidal couldn't just fall flat out. Something happened. Okay, sit quietly here. She ordered her mother and closed the closet. She listened to the sounds on the first floor. Silence, deathly silence. Rufina had already understood what awaited her. She slowly descended the stairs, but as soon as she reached the first step, she heard a voice. Come down. Stop hiding. Rufina emerged into the light. A gun was pointed at her. On impulse, she raised her hands as if surrendering. She had always been afraid of guns. Even when watching cartoons where weapons were used, she already felt immense fear and horror. Move here quickly. Miriam ordered and pointed to a chair next to Vidal. He sat there, also with his hands raised. Rufina realized that either the end or a happy beginning was about to happen. Give me the receipt. Miriam said sternly, addressing Vidal. He remained silent. She gave him a painful knee to the groin, causing him to hunch over and groan. Where's it? Miriam screamed. Miriam, Rufina said, almost crying. You're doing something horrible right now. It's a mistake. Think about it. Rufina began to plead with her, but it seemed to only anger her more. Miriam aimed the gun directly at Rufina's forehead. The girl, as best she could, maintained her composure, but her lips and hands trembled with a slight quiver. If you don't hand over the receipt, your head will shatter into countless pieces. Miriam threatened. I don't have it, Rufina confessed. Rufina felt Miriam's fingers tighten, ready to pull the trigger into her forehead, but suddenly, a squad of police burst into the house. Put the gun on the ground. The chief shouted. Miriam smirked at Rufina, turned to the police, and, with an innocent smile, placed the weapon on the floor. Tie her up. The chief ordered his officers immediately. 
They quickly put iron handcuffs on Miriam. You have the right to remain silent, one of the sergeants warned her and escorted her to the police car. Other police officers were scattered throughout the house. They burst into all the rooms, went to the second floor, and found poor Patricia. It was she who had called the police using her cell phone. When Rufina untied her hands, Patricia found the phone in her pocket. Fortunately, the phone, which was rarely used and had the sound turned off on the wedding day, had not completely run out of battery. This saved everyone. Rufina thanked God for her mother. Without her, everyone would already be corpses. Thank you for your assistance, Vidal said, shaking hands with the officer. I promise you, we will get to the bottom of this. In the hall, they led Patricia. She looked really bad. Her face and body were covered in bruises and injuries. Rufina rushed into her mother's arms, but they pushed her away since Patricia could have fractures or injuries. Two weeks passed. Patricia took a long time to recover in the hospital. She was diagnosed with a concussion, a broken leg, and numerous serious contusions. Rufina visited her every day and tried to bring her favorite flowers. Do you know why my favorite flowers are lilies? Patricia asked her daughter when she brought a bouquet of these white flowers once again. No. Why? Rufina asked with interest. Your father and I met in a field, and he gave me lilies, picked from the garden at his grandmother's. Oh, he got into trouble for that. But after that, he always gave me only these flowers. Rufina sat next to her mother's bed, and the woman began crying. Mom, what's the matter? Rufina asked, wiping a tear from poor Patricia's cheek. After all, I got married for love, but you. I didn't understand you. I wanted to give you away to someone I considered suitable. I'm so ashamed, my dear. Mom, I'm already married. I love Vidal, and he loves me. Everything is fine with us. Why are you so upset, then? I ruined the happiest day of your life, cried Patricia. No, Mom, you made it unforgettable, smiled Rufina. Everyone will remember this wedding for a long time, and I'll have something to tell the kids. Sweetie, you are the most sincere and kind one. My sunshine. Rufina kissed her mom on the forehead as a sign of reconciliation, and suddenly it felt like a burden was lifted from her shoulders. It felt so good. Old grievances were left in the past, now they lived only in the present. Three weeks later, the trial took place. It turned out that Miriam had borrowed a significant amount from Patricia two months ago. However, her business dealings went downhill, and she had nothing to repay. So, she hired special people who would do anything to get compensation. They kidnapped poor Patricia. At first, Miriam planned to simply intimidate her friend and engage in so-called blackmail. But then Miriam realized that Patricia was very unreliable and would immediately tell everything to the police. In a way, she was right. Patricia wouldn't listen to any of her conditions. Blackmail was still blackmail. That's why Miriam intended to starve her to the point where Patricia would die on her own. It would have been a terrible, agonizing death. Miriam received a lengthy sentence, and her accomplices got their fair share too. Patricia was happy for her young ones. She eventually understood that she was wrong about Vidal because he was the one who helped in her search. It doesn't matter what the nationality of your spouse is. The main thing in a relationship is sincere and pure love. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.